Horror Hounds, welcome back to Sheeby Jeebies, a horror podcast by fans, for fans, and about fans. It's a river of Sam! I'm your host, Sam Carlson, and my co-host will have to explain his very goofy nickname. Yes. So, uh, I'm not the Carpathian, carp being a fish, I'm the Bass Pathian. The Bass Master Pathian. Exactly. Yeah. A uh, better Pathian, if you will. <laughs> That was such a bad joke. You know, I just let out like the longest, most disappointed fart in the green room when you explained it. Just sad. Yes. I mean. But we're saving our review for 2016 for later. Ooh, good call. Yeah, today we're continuing on our quest to go through all of the Ghostbusters movies. And we're on Ghostbusters 2 from 1989, also directed by Ivan Reitman. So... This was, again, I mentioned this before on the last show, but this was one of my earliest memories as a child is, you know, being on this uh, baby quilt that I think one of my grandmothers had made. And, you know, looking, you know, looking at the newspaper because I was looking at the, the comic section and just seeing an ad for Ghostbusters 2 in there. And, you know, being excited because I was already watching the, the cartoon at that point. And the cartoon definitely had a significant influence on two and kind of does take the edge off of it quite a bit compared True. to the first one. Yeah, it does. Um, so I know that you had seen two in theaters. Yes. And you also saw the real Ghostbusters cartoon, of course. Of course. Do you have any memories of like contrasting those two at the time or is that too far back? Um, not so much contrasting, but more just... Like, oh, hey, it's Slimer. Oh, oh, hey, they're wearing different kind of outfits. Or, oh, hey, I remember this kind of stuff. Because um, I was, what, uh, 82? So I was, like, six at the time, six and a half. Mm. Uh, just moved into my first house. Um, I remember, like, before going to theater, um, somebody, like, uh, some farm equipment had turned around in our driveway and scratched it. So my parents are upset before we go to the movies. <laughs> it's like a brand new driveway. What the fuck? So, um, yeah, so watching it, I didn't feel, I, I guess I was too young to realize the difference between Ghostbusters 1 and Ghostbusters 2. Because to me, it was like, oh, cool, Ghostbusters. It's these cool four guys who bust ghosts um, and save the city. And they're Slimer to help out. Yeah, that's, you know, we don't really pick up on the nuances until we're much older. Yeah. Yeah, I... <laughs> We've been trying to record this for almost a month, I think. Yeah, it's it. I think it's because Ghostbusters one such holds high, you know, into us uh, that it's easier to, to you know riff on Ghostbusters one, not riff, but as in like just kind of spur the moment, kind of talk about it. But Ghostbusters two, uh, I mean, I know you watched more than Ghostbusters one, at least as a kid. Whereas this one, I don't watch nearly as much as Ghostbusters one for me. So mm. it's hard to really kind of like really nail down what we like about the movie besides the soundtrack of course oh my god the soundtrack is superior to the first one and uh, you know i don't care if that's an unpopular opinion but i went through the they have you know playlists on youtube i went and mm -hmm. i listened to ghostbusters 2 a couple days ago and it's just all around you know pretty outstanding oh well, exactly as well as like i'm going to show off like i picked up the uh this little vinyl here uh, from Shapeshift Records. Uh, it is a essentially chiptune Super Nintendo version of the Ghostbusters 2 soundtrack. There's not one for the Ghostbusters 1 soundtrack, but there's one for the Ghostbusters 2 soundtrack. I'm interested to hear what the chiptune version of Oingo Boingo's Flesh and Blood sounds like. So, or Spirit. Oh, that Spirit would be good too. Yeah. Also, you know, of course, we have to touch about the fact that Bobby Brown's got a couple of songs on, on the soundtrack, and he shows up as in a cameo in the movie, too. Yeah. On Our Own is legit 
almost always on a playlist for me, not even just a Halloween playlist, just whatever I'm listening to on our own is going to be on there. But I think that we haven't really given enough, like we don't really take into account that we're back is also excellent. Well, no, we're back is great too. But I will say also with on our own, um, you hear Ghostbusters when it's around Halloween time. Mm-hmm. On our own, you'll hear um, every so often is randomly at places. Like I hear it at HB all the fucking time. Oh my God, I know. Isn't that, oh, oh I lo- okay. I get so excited when I hear music from horror movies in the grocery store when I'm mm-hmm. shopping. So this is, you know, not Ghostbusters related, but, you know, obviously they have had Ghostbusters songs when we're yeah. at, when I'm in H-E-B sometimes. One time, though, I heard the song um, from Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, where Jesse's dancing in his bedroom. And I'm just like looking around like, does anybody else hear this? Am I the only one noticing this? <laughs> so that was, yeah. Man, I, I know. It's like you can tell how old we are because we get excited about grocery store mu- music. Yeah. We, we find excitement in any in kind of usual places. Mm-hmm. But so on with the On Our Own song, you know, obviously we remembered the whole thing about the whole video, right? You, yes. know, cause it, you know, it had quite a few, you know, it had Rick Moranis, but I mean, not really surprising because he was in Ghostbusters too. Yeah. But Morgan Fairchild was in it. Um, Caitlyn Jenner. Sorry, I'm just trying to not misgender her. Uh, and also Donald Trump. You know, but you know, Donald Trump also shows up at Home Alone too. Oh, yeah, exactly. Because at the time, '80s was very New York, and New York was very Donald Trump at that time. Yeah, and it's it's funny because in the novelization of Ghostbusters two, there's a part where Ray is comparing, you know, different figureheads that took advantage of the breakdown of society, and you know, brings up Hitler, and then also, but and bring you know, and um, brings up. Donald Trump within that same comparison. And I was like, this might be the earliest comparison of Donald Trump to Hitler in the wild that I've seen. Oh yeah. But I mean, Stein, George Steinbrenner was also in that mix too. So, but you know, I mean, Dan Aykroyd, when they were still working on Ghostbusters three, the Ghostbusters in hell one, you know, and there was the alternate dimension of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So you had a, the, you know, the Lucifer figure was named Luke Siffler, which is like, oh, that's cute. Uh, It's a little obvious, but it's cute. Mm -hmm. And he was supposed to, you know, he was supposed to be a Donald Trump-like real, you know, Donald Trump-like figure, a real estate developer. And Dan Aykroyd wanted Alec Baldwin to play him. That is weird, dude. I mean, Dan Aykroyd does tap into some weird stuff. What if he's not like our generation's Nostradamus and nobody's paying attention to him? I know. I found something. Vodka now. I know, right? It is the vodka. Um, yeah. So, mm. but yes. Anyway, Ghostbusters two soundtrack absolutely superior to the original. Sorry, guys. It's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, we've been trying to record this for a while, but um, it's mostly because we've been on vacation. We were in, vaca- in Louisiana for about 10 days for our anniversary, so it was like, there's no time to do anything. No. Especially- we were too busy eating and gambling. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, yeah, we went to uh, Rain, and how far is that from... Well, that's not very far from Lafayette at all. It's just down the like 20 minutes. Yeah. So... Rain, Louisiana is the frog capital of the world, and I love frogs. So I was very excited because this little town is like little frog statues here and there, like frog murals. And we stopped at this, you know, we stopped at this one place because we had some time to kill was the Frog City Casino. And we go in because uh, my friend Scott, he and I had very like, our birthdays were really close together. Mine is the 12th and his is 13th of September. So a couple of years we went to Vegas and the first time, you know, that we went to Vegas, we found the Ghostbusters slot machine. That was super exciting. But I just, you know, I decided that we should go stop in at Frog City because Scott knew how much I loved frogs and he would have thrown a bitch fit if I didn't go to a casino called Frog fucking City. So we go in, bam, there's a Ghostbusters slot machine. Yep. It wasn't the one that had like the. It wasn't the the full featured one though. 
No, no, it wasn't. It was more just like a video poker version of one. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, because it had a bunch of different <laughs> games in it. Yeah. So this was kind of a, a more pared down version. I don't know what a the multicade, if you will. A what? A multicade. Yeah. I mean, this was a more pared down version of it. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know what the the bonuses looked like because you know we we didn't hit any. You know. Yeah, we'll put like twenty bucks in. Yeah, you're know, just wasting time anyway. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like Louisiana is great. The food is wonderful. So we've been extremely busy between that and then also we just finished night one of WrestleMania. So eventually we'll get back on track. Yeah. So when I was, when we were first starting to, tr like when I was first getting like notes together, it was March 10th to give you guys an idea. And that was when we just had the time change and we lost an hour. So I get up and it's pretty early on a Sunday and I'm just, you know, getting my notes. And I'm like, oh, let's see. On Ghostbusters 2, I'm just, let me check out Vigo. And so it turns out that the actor that played Vigo, um, Wilhelm von Homburg, uh, you know, his stage name, a real name is Norbert Gruppe. He had died on uh, March 10th, 2004. So it was 20 years to the day. And I was like, wow. This is a sign. So I do a little bit more research and I found this fantastic article uh, for on a uh, dead spin from Sean Raviv called uh, the hateful life and spiteful death of the man who was Vigo, the Carpathian, which I'm like, how bad are we talking? Live your gimmick. And so Norbert was born to Richard's girlfriend during the war and she wasn't really interested in having much to do with him. Uh, Norbert was always really jealous of Winfred, who was Richard's son from his first marriage, because Winfred, you know, had his mother in his life. So there's a lot of trauma there, you know, early age. Um, but, you know, there was a second marriage to a woman named Ursula, who was much younger than Richard, and she was actually closer in age to Norbert. And they had a daughter named Rona. So according to Richard, Norbert raped Ursula. So his half-sister may actually be his daughter. Mm-hmm. So, Vigo, you can fucking rest in piss, dude. Fuck that guy. Exactly. That was fun. Apparently, it wasn't a sign that we needed to record. Weird. Yeah. You know, so now that, you know, we've just, like, really brought anyone, everyone down, we can actually talk about the movie. The movie itself. I know. And also, I do have to apologize for being an asshole, um... Well, not being an asshole, because I'm always an asshole, and you I don't, don't think I need to. What? <laughs> so don't apologize for that, no. I don't, I'm not going to. I'm going to apologize for being fucking wrong, though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because the, the, uh, ep the last episode that we were talking about Ghostbusters, we also mentioned the Cleaning Up the Town documentary. So there is a sister documentary called Too Hot to Handle for Ghostbusters 2. I thought it was already out. Nope. <laughs> Um, apparently it's been, it's still in post-production. It's been there for a while. It's too cold to hold. Ooh. I mean, let's hope not. I think. Yeah, exactly. I look forward to it if it come, when it comes out, because the first one was really good. Yeah. I mean, one of the producers said that they were about most of the way done, about 98% done with the editing, and they were working on some archival footage. And this was back in October. So, and crossing my fingers that we can get it, that we can get a release this year. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Ghostbusters 2 had a really insane shooting schedule. You know, with the first one we had about, was about 12 to 13 months. Oh yeah, from like idea to on mm -hmm. uh, in theater. Yeah, and this one, the shooting schedule was November 88 to March 89. Yeah, I don't know if that's very... starting from the conception of Ghostbusters 2 or not though. I don't think so. I think it's just more to a shooting schedule, but still, a shooting schedule that short is pretty damn fucking short. Yeah, you know, I I wonder if it's because they had industrial light and magic on the on it, and they thought, well, they don't need that much time. Exactly. These guys got it. They need Star Wars. It's fine. I don't know. Uh, and I, I hate to be that person. Like I was not as impressed with with ILM as I was with Boss Media. Oh yeah. Especially the effects just look miles, you know, miles better. Mm -hmm. I just. You know, and part of the problem is I'm, you know, the effects, especially like with the slime in the bathtub and the the slime that's falling off of the the movie theater during the Flip City montage, and then the slime shell over the museum. I'm just thinking about the blob. 
you know, and, and the original is ex exactly a love letter to New York. But Ghostbusters 2 is sort of like the seven-year itch, if that makes sense. It kind of is, because the first one is a straight-up love letter. We love this city. Uh, I love this town. You know, that's how it ends. Um, but 2 very much feels like we are still in love with the town, but the town has changed. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of the beat-for-beat uh, beat familiarity with the original kind of comes from. Besides the, you know, similar scenes, but a lot of the same energy of, like, New York's great, uh, except for all the negativity. You know, and I know that the first, you know, some complain that the cynical humor is missing, but it's a different kind of cynicism, right? Yes. Because yes. You go from saving the world and getting the girl, and then you're being sued by every agency in New York for property damage, and then the girl married another guy and had his baby. Mm -hmm. And it's like, sometimes there isn't a happy ending. Uh, exactly. And it's almost like uh, Ghostbusters 2 is where if you just give in to the cynicism, because the first one, kind of cynicism is kind of making commentary on certain things, mm -hmm. whereas 2 is like, all right, just give in, give up, don't care where uh, that's kind of beginning, that's why everything becomes really bad and negative, but still having that heart of like, no, we need to keep trying. We need to, there is a chance. There is there is positivity overall. We need to save this marriage. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, but you know, considering this is more of a kid's movie than the first, you know, yes. real Ghostbusters, like the Gen, X Gen Xers and the elder millennials are being set up for some hard truths about life at an early age. Exactly. It's not always a happy ending. You don't save the world every fucking time. No. Or sometimes when you do save the world, uh, everybody who's left is like, you know what? Fuck you. And it's like, well, I just tried helping. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we do see a lot of the after effects of also, you know, because essentially, you know, in the first one, you see them interacting with police and I'm guessing other, for, you know, other first responders like EMS, you know, when they have to bring Lewis there, right? Mm-hmm. But this is sort of like now you're actually having to deal with the fact that this is like a small business dealing with bigger government. Yeah. So. I mean, and then even then, I was going to say, the government is still like, that's another thing that's kind of similar to the first one, is the government is still kind of the bad guy at times in this movie. Uh, whether it's with the courtroom scene where it's uh, somebody who's annoyed by the Ghostbusters, who wishes he could use the government to kill them. <laughs> it's, it's like, I'm going to burn at the stake. Uh, or uh, with the mayor's office, where it's kind of like, hey, he's looking to become the governor soon. Um, don't say anything bad about him. The Ghostbusters is like, well, we're trying to save the world here. Can we need help us out here? Uh, oh, we're going to go to the news media and talk about how the government didn't save, the mayor didn't save anybody. And they're like, oh, all right, put him in the institution. They're actually crazy. Uh, so... Uh, they get arrested in the first movie. The second one, they get uh, involuntarily um, committed. Because know, the government is like, you know what? We're going to protect ourselves over our citizens. Oh, yeah. Very true. Very, very true. But so, yeah, so that's why I think, like, kind of like, it still has a libertarian bent to Ghostbusters 2, like Ghostbusters 1 does. Mm -hmm. So, in case you've never seen Ghostbusters 2, this story focuses on Dana's baby, Oscar, and it's not Venkman's son. Uh, she actually went and, you know, after she and Venkman broke up, she married some other dude and then had his baby and then he picked up and went to Europe. Whatever. It happens. Typical so, musician. There's an evil painting in the museum that Dana's doing art restoration at that is trying to possess her child so he can be reborn. And, you know, we, that is Vigo the Carpathian. Also, we have the River of Mood Slime, which is just a naturally occurring thing underneath New York City, apparently. And Vigo is using that to his own evil ends so he can possess Oscar. And of course, the Ghostbusters have to get involved and once again save the day. Mm -hmm. Pretty straightforward. So Dana's boss, Janos Poha, who is played by Peter McNichol, he gets possessed by the painting of Vigo to do his bidding, kind of like a little Renfield, a little ghoulish there. Mm -hmm. And oh my God, he is, <laughs> Peter McNichol does such a good job at playing Janos, just so over the top with it. And uh, originally Janos was supposed to be a character named Jason Locke, 
but it was McNichol who was talking to Ivan Reitman and Harold Ramis and say, hey, make make him come from Carpathia and like kind of link him to Vigo, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know much more about the development of Janos as a character, but during during the filming, Peter McNichol spent a bunch of time like working on like a backstory for Janos, like his origin and the accent. And then also the mythology for Carpathia and making a Carpathian flag, which was a snake stepping on a man, which is like, no step on snake. No step on snake. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, the Ghostbusters 2 audiobook, the narrator, when he does Janos's accent, he's, he's going from, He's going from one end where it's the old like in Soviet Russia verb noun verbs you, mm -hmm. and then the other end is Doctor Nick Riviera from The Simpsons. So, you know the I appreciate McMickle's dedication to the character and to making the backstory, but you know like Carpathia is just the Carpathian Mountains, which is you know in the Czech Republic goes through Poland and Hungary. Uh, Serbia, also Romania and and the and uh, Ukraine. I'm probably missing one. <laughs> and then, uh, so Vigo the Carpathian, the sorrow of Moldavia, right? So, in between Russia and Ukraine, Moldova is just the, the descendant of the Principality of Moldavia, which was existed from 1359 to 1859, which saw its territory being broken up between. Uh, Moldova in the between the region of Moldova in Romania, Moldova and Ukraine. So you don't really need to like make a mythology. I mean, you could make a mythology, but I mean, these places already existed. So yeah, you know, especially because like in the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, like alchemy, like alchemists weren't welcome in Europe. But you know, Prague was like, oh, you alchemy, come on down over here. So you know, they could have done something with Vigo you know, being some sort of old bohemian alchemist, that would have worked. Yeah. You know, he was, yeah, they do, don't they refer to him as a sorcerer or at least a magician? They, they do. They're a magician kind of sorcerer. They, they definitely refer to him as that at times. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of makes sense. Uh, if they had gone that way of like, oh, alchemy, that's kind of how he's harnessing the, the unknown element of the slime kind of stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that, okay, honestly, you could have tied that into spiritual alchemy, you know, because spiritual alchemy is just the, the process of individuation and making all of those different parts of you into a whole uh, and, you know, essentially using the mood slime to achieve that effort. You know, there's a lot of things you could have done with the script. And I feel like, man, it's a little too, you know, it gets it's probably a little too esoteric for your mainstream movie audiences, but it was not a bad idea. Well, exactly, I agree. Uh, but yeah, no, Janos was a great part of this movie. And a lot of, I think, the, the more familiar scenes involve Janos mm -hmm. with his crazy ass accent. It's like, where are you from? The Upper West Side? <laughs> and his flashlight eyes. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. But also, what the, there's the part where Janos, when Janos abducts Oscar, right? He turns into a ghost, but he's a ghost dressed as, you know, kind of an old, it looks like an old nanny, like an old yeah. English nanny, like almost a, like a, what you would imagine, like an old Mary Poppins might be. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, you know, then we have to go back and think about, you know, think about how did he, is this astral projection? Or... It could also go back with what we talked about with the mood slime in general being part of imagination and, and him harnessing that energy. because. Uh, Vigo's been harnessing the energy for a while now. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how he's trying to come back. And so he's been giving some of that power to Yadosh, his Renfield. Um, and Renfield's now using that power as well for his own means. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think the flashlight eyes are super helpful, though. Oh, yes. Yeah. Especially during the blackout. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't think that's... I mean, unless the mood slime is making him a ghost temporarily, which, you know... Spoilers for Frozen Empire, that's apparently a thing you can do in yeah. in Ghostbusters land, so. Have you heard the theory about that the Ghostbusters are dead and they're in purgatory for during two? 
I could see that because that was a really big explosion to try and survive with like just fluff on you. Yeah. You know, so basically everybody's dead. And even though you see them come down and to all of these cheers, that's sort of like to help them move into the next part of their spiritual journey, which in two would be purgatory. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> they have to focus on like, you know, coming to terms with things that they dealt with in the first movie as to essentially purify themselves before they can enter heaven by understanding those past mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, Ray is pretty much the easiest one. Like, Ray, man, you conjured a hundred foot marshmallow man and killed us all, dude. Well, as well as he feels so sorry for everything he did by accident. And he has all that guilt uh, associated with him, which is why he's suffering so much trying to keep the business alive. Yeah, and like bros not only not only try to keep the business alive by doing kids birthday parties with winston mm -hmm. he also has an occult bookstore yeah he's also running a shop and you know i have to what like i wonder i'm guessing at some we don't really you know we don't really see a lot of the firehouse in two. Oh no not at all i don't think you see any firehouse at all in two really <laughs> no. well, at least not early on i think you see it later on uh, wondering... as they kind of like get more established again but yeah I'm just like wondering if Ray's operating Ghostbusters out of the back of the bookstore. Probably. Probably. For a good time. Um, but, you know, he's, you know, in his, like, you know, running this bookstore and he's kind of like researching things. And I feel like that's also him just kind of going back into himself, trying to figure out how he could have prevented what he did by conjuring up the marshmallow man. Like, how do you go back and fix that? And so exactly. you can't actually turn back time, but you can make better choices. You know, you can make better choices that affect your future. And, and inevitably that's what happens into, because instead of conjuring up the giant thing, he's controlling the giant thing. Exactly. The second right. the end. Exactly. Yeah. Cause like he does go through that journey. Cause it's almost like he made the greatest mistake of his life possible. He hurt everybody he loves and he's trying to make sure that never happens again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, we could sit here all day and look at the karmic journeys of each one of the Ghostbusters characters. Mm -hmm. um, I still think it is kind of an interesting way of looking at Ghostbusters too. Mm -hmm. And the whole beat for beat thing makes a little bit more sense that way. And It does. Because if you're yeah. trying to relive and re, uh, I, I guess fix what you did before you're going to go through those motions again of like how you fucked up before how you didn't fuck up as bad as you thought you fucked up before uh and then just kind of that karmic journey yeah and but you know what's also good is that you can just take that you know take the whole purgatory angle out too mm -hmm. although you know it's fun because you know we do see the ghostbusters in little angelic forms around baby oscar after they defeat vigo so it's sort of like oh look so was that, and that does go with the predatory thing of they finally uh, defeated their own eternal evils uh, and ascended. Mm -hmm. The main message of Ghostbusters 2 is what you put in, the energy that you put into things is what you're going to take out of them. So you don't even really need the purgatory angle to enjoy the movie. Uh, no. I think actually it makes more sense when it's sort of like this is the, the second, the, the love letter to New York part two. This is when it's like you're having to put more effort into that marriage, right? Because it's like, oh, shit went south. Wonder what happened. Mm -hmm. Better go back and figure it out, guys. Mm -hmm. You know? It's just a, that's what the mood slime is there for. Yeah. The mood slime also is something that we all need to talk about because nobody seems to appreciate how fucking complex it is. So... I think the one the, the one thing that I got really caught up on was the courtroom scene with the mm -hmm. Solari brothers. Because the judge gets pissed off enough so that the Scolari brothers pop out of the slime. Now I'm thinking about it and I'm just trying to break it down, right? So when the judge causes this to happen, the slime's accessing a very strong emotion, and that's intertwined with a memory. And mm -hmm. the memory is going to probably be either sentencing the Scolaris or maybe it's seeing them executed. 
Uh, I believe it's watching them executed, which is why they're on the chair when they first pop out. Okay, so I'm thinking about that more too. Because mm -hmm. uh, we don't really have like, so they stopped using the electric chair in New York in 1963. I honestly have no idea if judges were allowed to witness people they sentenced getting getting electrocuted. That's that would be that's fucking wild if true, man. Well, I mean, I, I don't see why not because it was a public viewing um, for execution for this the family and kind of law inform uh, involved as well as uh, I don't doubt the judge would flex his muscles to be able to get access to that, and this judge in particular would a hundred percent do that yeah i'm on i'm kind of creeped out thinking about it what? so oh you're freezing again oh sorry that's okay you're just pulling a stone it's fine exactly you're pulling a stone <laughs> uh so anyway so now what i'm thinking is all right so i guess if you want to do the keep it simple stupid method Mm -hmm. then that emotion is accessing the memory of watching the Scolaris be executed, right? Yeah. yeah. So the alternative to that would be that the slime is accessing an emotion that's intertwined with either a memory or the judge's imagination of what happened. Okay. If the judge wasn't in if the judge wasn't watching them be executed, the slime is accessing the judge's like memory of what he thinks happened, which okay. is wild. So and those are possibilities that are very weird in this universe to me. But it's almost like I could see that being more likely true about the imagination because of with Ray controlling the, the Statue of Liberty at the end, it's his imagination. It's yes, he's using the NES Advantage controller, but his imagination of believing he can control oh, and move no. it. Oh, Fuck, this just got even more complicated. I don't think it's more complicated. I think the imagination part is better fitting than the memories because it makes more sense. I, okay, well, I mean, the imagination part also makes more sense if, you know, Fucking Washington Square Ghost. What is that? Uh, it looks like an old movie monster kind of stuff. Yeah, and I mean, it also makes more sense when you're talking about the ghost that's coming out of the movie theater. Yes. Also, it makes more sense when you think about the fur coat. Exactly, the imagination. Not memory, it's imagination. Uh, man... Now I'm, man, I already fell down this rabbit hole once and I had just gotten out of it. No, back in the hole with you. I know, I'm so upset. Uh, just, but I mean, so also here's the thing. This is another aspect of the slime that we have to talk about too. The Scolaris, those probably, those aren't, those probably aren't ghosts, guys. They're probably no. just, projections or holograms or copies or whatever you want to call them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And if your argument is that, no, those are the ghosts of the Scolari brothers. Okay, hold on. So you're telling me that this mood slime accessed the judge's emotion, which accessed a memory, which resurrected the dead. But okay. I don't see how it could resurrect the dead. I, I feel like it's more just... It's if, manifestation of the energy itself kind of made form. But what else? It makes more sense. Okay, well, I don't know. Can, so it can just make ghosts? But I mean, what if the Scalarias don't have unfinished business? What that's, if, that's, that, that's why they're not real ghosts, I feel like. They, they're just a manifestation of the chaotic uh, negative energy, the negative supernatural energy from the uh slime because it bursts forth it's bubbling over it's increasing in size and mass and so forth and it's kind of poof the square brothers pop out that's true that's another thing part of the fucking government bullshit is the government doesn't give a fuck about the ghostbusters and they want to kill them until like oh shit we're in trouble please help us ghostbusters but yeah you know it's weird thinking about the imagination as aspect of it now mm-hmm 
but that also would explain why the mayor was talking to the ghost of Fior Fiorello LaGuardia previously. Yeah. You know, because he's thinking about how to lead his city. And I don't know. I feel like that might actually be a memory, though. It's either a memory or um, imagination and so forth. Because LaGuardia was a very well-known mayor. They named the fucking airport after him. So mm -hmm. um, he's thinking about, like, what did LaGuardia do with uh, chaos and stuff like that? And it's like, oh, he destroyed pinball machines, whatever. I don't give a fuck. But um, what? what? Is that a real oh. Oh, no, that was part of him anti-gambling. Pinball Machines looked at his gambling at the time. I think LaGuardia was the one uh, who came down hard on Pinball Machines. But anyway, so uh, previous big mayors. Um, so, like, the city's known for. So he's going to think about, like, what am I going to be remembered for as the mayor? Uh, I, I, my, in my term as mayor, we've had two huge ghost events. The first one, we swept under the rug as, like, oh, no, it's imagination. We These charlatans made things up. Happens again, it's like, okay, motherfucker, we know it's real now. Mm -hmm. So, you, and it's his aspirations of becoming governor and all these things going down. So, he's gonna, of course, he's gonna think about LaGuardia or other uh, stuff. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's fair. Mm -hmm. Thinking more about the imagination aspect to the slime. So, that kind of makes sense when you put it with Vigo also, mm -hmm. because, you know, he's just, an evil painting, but you know, paintings are just a di like another interpretation of reality, though, essentially. Yeah. And then that also fits into the whole karmic journey because you know, you oh, you see the the river of slime in that one shot uh, of the painting with Vigo in it, where it's just the head and it looks like Zordon from Power Rangers. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but you know, rivers are symbolic of change. So it kind of all fits in together somehow. Yeah. So Ray, Egon, and Winston go into go underground again to the old pneumatic transit system and to go investigate the River of Slime, as that's where Ray had seen it before when he was underground the first time and caused the giant citywide blackout. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's a creepy, it's a creepy environment. And Winston, you know, is creeped out. Everybody's kind of a little on edge. And I think the slime is definitely picking up on that in that atmosphere. Yeah. You know, because we get that ran, you know, we get the 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 one where we don't like Winston go, you know, Winston doesn't get an echo back like the other two. Oh yeah, because they're like, oh echo and then Win. Winston. <sighs> yes. Yeah. It's picking up on his fear. Yeah. You know? And that's possibly something he's imagining also happening. Or worried about happening. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, you know, we get the jump scare of all those heads on pikes, which, you know, as a kid, yeah, that's pretty intense. Oh, it is. You know, but again, those are just definitely just the slime fucking with them. Yeah. So, you know, and they get a little snipey back and forth, and you can kind of see how... You start off at that point, and then they eventually get sucked into the river of slime, deposited out in front of the museum, and they're fighting with each other. Exactly. And that, uh, I think that's more with the negativity of the city absorbed into the slime mm -hmm. and just the residual energy coming out. That's what got to snipe with each other. Because they're really snipe with each other when they're really close to the river. Then when they fall into the river later on, come out later, they're fighting with each other, like physically fighting with each other. Mm -hmm. Yep. But, you know, as far as the ghost train itself... I think that might have been Egon, you know, because after that ghost train passes through Winston, Egon asks him if it was this specific train number of whenever. Mm -hmm. And Winston is, you know, no, I don't know. I missed it. <laughs> still pretty, a still a pretty funny line. Oh, it is. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm coming to the conclusion more and more that now that we have to factor in imagination as a big ability of the slime. And after Ray, Egon, and Winston crawl out of the river of slime in front of the museum and they're fighting with each other, Egon realizes, no, it's the slime. It's, you know, it's take off your clothes. I'm like, okay, Egon, whatever you say. <laughs> but no, and then they have to, you know, they realize it's it's all flowing to the museum. And, you know, that's where Dana works. Mm -hmm. And it's connected to Vigo. 
And so they have to go find, you know, Peter and Dana and, you know, they're on a date. And so we get that great part where they just burst in this fancy restaurant and scare all the straights. As they're all on their long johns covered in slime. Oh, it's, oh my God. And then he goes, so go to the museum. <laughs> get slime in that one woman's cleavage. Mm -hmm. Oh man. And of course, like they get arrested. Kind of. Well, they don't. E I don't even think they really get arrested as much as they are escorted out of the restaurant. Peter goes with them, and then they go to the mayor. Like they're like, yes. we need to talk to the mayor, and they take them to the mayor's mansion, to Gracie Mansion. I'm like, okay. And you know, then Hardemeyer, after they go on this whole spiel and threaten to go to the New York Post and call this like Slime Square, Hardemeyer has them involuntarily committed. Mm -hmm which you don't even have that kind of power, man. And I really do like that scene because, you know, you've got Brian Doyle Murray as their doctor and you know, like Bill Murray has his head down. So you can't see how much they look alike. Uh, but a deleted scene, Eugene Levy plays uh, Lewis's, oh gosh, Lewis's cousin, I believe it is. Yeah. Sherman. And Sherman's the one that actually gets them out of, uh, you know, out of the, out of being committed. And because he's a dermatologist and just writes a note. He's like, like oh, I'm a doctor. Dr. Yeah, Dr. Sherman says I'm free. That's exactly how all of this works. So anyway, then, you know, they're like, hey, Mr. Mayor, can we borrow the Statue of Liberty? We'll bring it back. We promise. Mm -hmm. And at this point, you know, after the, after the Titanic just arrived, I, you know, the mayor's pretty much willing to do anything, you know. I I don't think that run for governor went well. Probably not. I mean, even if you were the mayor that saved the city, you still took your sweet time. I, I don't know. Spin it. They could have spun it pretty well. Who knows? I don't know. I don't think you really get a career in politics after that. So, yeah, and then, you know, I love the, the part with, you know, Ray had stolen that cigar from the mayor's office earlier, and he's just smoking it inside the Statue of Liberty, spraying it down with slime. And I'm not going to make, like, the you know, I'm not, I'd like to make a dirty joke, but I'm just not going to. I'm just not going to do it, man. I'm more highbrow than that now. Um, so... They navigate the Statue of Liberty, you know, after they've got it coated with slime and it's like pulsing Jackie Wilson. They navigate it down New York or, you know, through the river and then into New York. And it raises its torch above its head and breaks the slime and, you know, breaks the slime barrier because there are also people outside that are, you know, starting to sing, right? To bring mm -hmm. positive energy. I think it's just people being drunk and partying on New Year's, but whatever works, right? Exactly. You know, and right, you know, like right before that, like right when, before the torch comes down and the Statue of Liberty is just kind of like over, like over the top of the slime shell, you kind of see the slime shrink back. And I'm like, is that an ET? Do they have ET fields? No, I'm not smart enough to to connect those two, unfortunately. Evangelion fans are their own breed of, of nerd. Yes. So I, you know, once they actually get into the museum, though, I never give a flying fuck about how this movie ends. Because it wraps up pretty fast after that. They get in the museum. Um, it's like Peter says, Happy New Year. Um, and then it's kind of like, oh, they tried to save Oscar. Uh, they take him. And then like, oh, he's tried to hide him. Oh, no, he overwhelms him and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's very fast and very kind of like, okay, got to wrap this up, guys. Let's go. We made Vigo the big bad guy and I could destroy him. Yeah, and it's not even it's not even a compelling fight. No. Uh like I Vigo is less of a compelling villain than the slime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel, you know, and sorry, Max von Sidow. I appreciate that you lent your voice efforts to this because the alternative is much worse. Yes. If you you know, if y'all have never looked up Norbert Gruppe doing the lines for Vigo. Y'all need to be thankful Max von Sydow came on board. But it's just, it just doesn't fucking matter, you know? Uh, refresh my memory. So, 
do they when do they get him back in the painting wait it's so, the scene that gets him back in the painting oh yeah so like he um he gets out uh he's kind of doing that weird kind of like hologram walk kind of around <laughs> um and he picks up the the baby then everybody starts singing outside for new years he starts losing his power um then he kind of possesses ray uh they hose ray down uh then he kind of goes back into the painting uh where he's just a floating head uh then they hose him down and then shoot behind him yeah uh, with the proton packs until it's done yeah and before... his life bar is decreased enough yeah and you know before that happens though you get to see vigo's face it's stuck in the painting before it's covered in slime and it's just kind of twisting. horns I, I didn't know he had horns i wasn't paying it's, attention it's, 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 it's kind of a, a more monster monsterization of his face well it just like his face is just pinched it looks like you're playing you know super mario 64 you know when you can like like stretch mario's face out at the beginning or what on one of those screens let's go mm -hmm. Yeah, and just it's just kind of a really lame finale. Kind of is. It's kind of like eh. Get an explosion. You up. Yeah, you get a little poof instead of the giant building right. clearing explosion from the first one. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. then you know Vigo's painting is replaced by the Ghostbusters and Oscar in the middle. Yep. Yeah. But you know what? I am so glad, especially knowing about, like, fucking Norbert Gruppe, I am so glad we never actually got that Vigo the Carpathian painting to put in the house. I know it's just, you know, a character, not the real person. But I'm good. Yeah, exactly. I'm good. But I, you know, honestly, I put the, you know, put the, the Renaissance version of the Ghostbusters and Oscar in there. Yeah. I'm good with that. So, I don't hate this movie. Oh, no, not at all. I don't dislike this movie. It's still sitting at number... It's still sitting at number two for me. You know, as far as, like, you know, I'm going for my rankings. It's like, right now, it's obviously one, two, right? Yeah. And I was really debating whether or not Frozen Empire would take number two... Uh, but no, apparently I'm still obsessed with the mechanics of the slime. Mm -hmm. And that's what's making it win out. Uh, I can see that because we have more time with it. Uh, I mean, Frozen Empire is a great, it's, it's sorry, not great. It's a good, it's a really good movie. But it's almost like we're trying to choose our favorite Jaw sequel when the, the first one is so fucking good and perfect. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm still going to like recommend it because it's good. Oh, definitely. But yeah, it's just, I just feel like this movie could have been more if they had just had a little bit more time to work on things. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, whatever. So it's Ghostbusters 2. And you guys are more than welcome to leave your comments or your questions or your hypotheses about the mood slime in the, com in the section below. And we'll also have links to socials and all the yada, yada, yada stuff. So ne next time we have to do answer the call and not, not looking forward to that, but it's, you know, we'll be, we're, we're tough, but fair here. We're professionals. Absolutely. But until then, command me Lord. The Visited by Voices Network is a consortium of content creators who explore genre art. Our collective aim is to jumpstart conversations in the horror community by providing unique viewpoints. We come to film and books with all the baggage and experiences from our everyday lives, and this allows us to see works through our own independent light prisms. At VBV Network, we reject groupthink 
consensus and social standards in regards to what makes narrative arts work. You may not often agree with us, but there will always be a respectful place for you to add your opinion to the mix. Oh, 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 oh,